Ladies and gentlemen, welcome! Welcome! It's Sunday! And it's going to be a bloody Sunday indeed. This is Shoutcraft Clan Wars, sponsored by MLG TV. My name is Total Biscuit, bringing you the cast and the production today, which is why both of them are terrible. But we will be bringing you two brilliant teams to compensate for that. Axiom and MVP coming your way to top tier Korean teams battling it out for the $500 prize that's given out for every every single one of these clan wars. $5,000 a month on the line for this event. Nice and easy win, you would think, but it's going to be a tough one. It's a best of seven pro league format with a 2v2 slotted in the middle there for good measure, and the lineup is killer. Have a look at that. Feast your eyes. Avaganda, as we say in the UK. Look at it. Not a single mirror match anywhere to be seen. Pretty much the A-teams from all teams. Yep, they're breaking them all out for this one. Kicking off with Heart versus Sniper on Wrecking Ball, a TVZ. Followed by Alicia versus Dream on Keru. Impact takes on Super on Fallen Dreams. And then the 2v2, Impact and Crank in a very unusual Z and P composition, which you usually don't see for the 2v2. Taking on Dongrei Gu and Keen. Follow that one up with Ryung versus Billowy and then Crank versus Keen on New Polaris Rhapsody. And of course, if the ace match happens on New Pompeii, anything can happen. All right, folks. We're going to get right into it. It's a Sunday. It's casual Sunday. That means we're wearing dressing gowns today, of course. So we either look homeless or extremely classy. Can't figure out which. It could be both. All right. We're going to get right into it. And that is actually the wrong map. <laughs> this is the right one. Good Lord. Why on earth was that one up? I could not tell you. But there you go. Indeed, it will be Heart versus Sniper. Young versus Billowy will not be coming in until later, assuming it actually gets to that. Heart versus Sniper. Well, Sniper is currently someone that plays in Pro League, as you're probably well aware. He does come out for MVP quite a bit. His success record is not terrible, but he really had his peak with his win at the end of Wings of Liberty for GSL. And he has not been able to repeat that success since then. And that is a concern for any player, really. His current form versus Terran is not too shabby, however. He has been able to pick up some wins in Pro League. He picked up a win against Maru. No, he didn't. He actually lost to Maru. Never mind. Sorry, I got that one wrong. He has been playing in Pro League and has been getting a decent amount of success. But in fact, actually, he is not. Sorry, I got that completely wrong. He has not actually won a game against Terran in Pro League in a little while. He lost to Maru. He did take out Natural 2-0 in the WCS Season 2 Career Qualifiers 2014. He lost to Fantasy. He lost to Fantasy again at IAM Cologne. He lost to Flash, and he lost to Bravo in the Code A Qualifiers. He's been being roughed up in this matchup, honestly. He has not beaten a Terran in quite some time, so... It's safe to say that there's a bit of a slump going on there. His last win was, of course, against Natural. But before that, he was able to beat Judgment in... I mean, it was last year's Code A. It's no big names, really. He did beat Hart and Ryung back in the Ace of Team Story Cup Season 1. So revenge is looking to happen here. As opposed to Hart. You know, how, how well exactly has Hart been doing lately? against Zerg. He's been playing quite a bit. His his win rate against Zerg is okay right now. He's won 15 out of the last 28 matches that he's played versus Zerg, but it is currently statistically his weakest matchup. He's very good against Terran. He's very good against Protoss right now. Uh, he comes off some really good recent wins, but his recent wins against Zerg, maybe, maybe not so brilliant. Yeah. He lost to Solar in the Home Story Cup qualifier. 2-1. He lost to Scarlet in Ace of Team Story Cup. He did beat Bly, and he lost to Roof as well, which was kind of a surprise. And he also lost to Jadong 2-1 in Lone Star Clash 3. So he's been picking up wins here and there in things like Go4SC2, as well as wins in Ace of Team Story Cup as well. He took out Leenok quite recently. He's been beating players like Petraeus and Suppy, but it's it's shaky. You know, and Sniper is a good player. So, we're going to get into it. It's going to be on Wrecking Ball. I'm looking forward to seeing where this one goes. Wrecking Ball is a map that we don't get to see too much in TBZ. So, hopefully it will be really, really fun indeed. And the countdown has now begun. Sniper taking on Heart in the first of this best of seven of the Shoutcraft Clan Wars, ladies and gentlemen. Please, if you would not mind getting hype. 
And if that wouldn't be too much trouble, then that would be brilliant, because this will be one of the best clan wars I think that we've had in a long time. I I'm going to say that now, and then it's just going to be a 4-0 stomp in either direction, and <laughs> it's going to be terrible. No, I, I very much doubt that. With the caliber of players we have today for this clan war, I find it highly unlikely that this is going to suck. It looks like it's going to be pretty damn good indeed. All right, here we go, folks. And in to Wrecking Ball we go, which still, for some reason, is called GH Testing Ziggity on Korea. If you are on the Korea server, you're looking to play on Wrecking Ball with your friends or whatever, it is called GH Testing Ziggity. We don't know why something is horribly broken there, but we will be going into this match momentarily. Sniper is just finishing off his load, and we'll see where this one goes. We have seen a little bit of TVZ action on this map. Not a huge amount, but a little bit in the Clan Wars. And it's it seems like a, a pretty reasonable map, honestly. But I have a feeling that it does have a... It's slightly famous Terran, I think, as far as I can tell. But I guess we're about to find out, aren't we? Because here we go. Wrecking Ball, ladies and gentlemen, will be the venue for the start of this match. Featuring Axiom Hart. He is in the Red Trunks, and he is playing Terran to the north of Wrecking Ball. Versus his opponent to the south position. In the blue trunks playing Zerg, MVP Sniper. A man I will never forgive. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be honest, I'll never forgive him, you know. He narrowly, so very narrowly, beat Ryung in GSL round of four in Las Vegas by one game. Oh, and that, that makes me salty. He also then beat Hyun, so he was the ultimate villain. He is a, he is a legend killer, he's a hero killer. He is a grand villain, even though his record lately has not been up to snuff. He is more than capable of taking on absolutely anybody if he puts his mind to it. Everyone will hate him for it, <laughs> and I think that's kind of unfortunate. It's not like it's Sniper's fault that things went the way that they did, but yeah, he is considered a bit of a villain. It's it's cool, though. I, I like that. It's a, it's a rather neat little story. Overlords heading across the map. Of course, you're quite limited as to where you can send your initial overlords. The missile turrets to the side here will prevent any kind of overlords going around the right side of the map. If you want to do that, you've got to do that and then take a sharp right and bring it around here. Which doesn't take too much extra time, so it's not really a problem. Let's see, a very standard opening out of heart here by the looks of it. Looks like that was gas and 12 supply, so it'll probably open up with a Reaper. It is not a great map for Reapers. There are very few ways to actually get into the base. There's this and the ramp, yeah, and you can jump down here as well. Everything else is Reaper-proof, so... It's not a brilliant opening for this specific map, but I do think that the idea of maps being bad for Reapers is kind of overstated. Usually you can get a Reaper in regardless and get a Scout, and that's all that really matters. And we're going to see a hatchery first here from Sniper, followed up by the gas and the pool. So no shenanigans coming out of him. There's the Reaper, and we're going to have a, a very straight up first few minutes by the looks of it. Hart is also scouting, interestingly enough, which he doesn't have to do, because he will have a Reaper. It does make me wonder if he wants to attempt to put a bunker up, and that won't do a huge amount, but it is kind of annoying, and it's not really a big investment. If Hart does decide to put that bunker up and gets it in a good position, like, say, on the high ground, which you can do on a map like this, because, as you can see, that is exactly where the natural is. It's up on the high ground, not the low ground, and that could be problematic. But it just looks like he, he wanted to scout to see if there was an expansion down, and then that that is what gave him the ability to place his own expansion. He said, you know what, I think I'm safe putting my expansion up here on this high ground position, and I don't have to worry too much about putting it on the low ground. And he just opens up with that one Reaper and doesn't do any kind of follow-up. So uh, it, it's a little bit of mining time lost because of the scout, but it allows him to make a safe decision, which is really what a scout is designed to do. All right, well, the these Reapers are going to be a little bit annoying. We might see a Zergling go down, although he did go in a little bit too deep on creep, and Sniper's control is looking really, really good here as well. The Queen is on the way, and once that pops out, this Reaper's not going to be able to get too much more done. He wants to take out a Ling, at least, and he might even get a second one here as well, and he does. So he can now leave. He might even get a third, actually. Oh, so close. He's looking for it. He really wants that, but the queen is popping out now, so he's got to back up. So he gets two links for free. It's not really much of a difference one way or the other, but he now feels just even more secure up here. But honestly, we're not seeing any early aggression coming out of Sniper at the moment. So unless Sniper wants to do something like a Roach Bane all in, which he's probably not going to do, then I don't really see it being too much of a problem. All right, we're going to see the factory follow up here for Hart, and it looks like he's going to play as standard as standard can be here. And the Overlord's going to spot that. It's going to be driven away here. This is not looking like a kill. 
Uh, there's a nice little point there that you can pop your overlord, but this is going to be just Hellion then Starport. It is, there's nothing more straight up than what Heart is doing at the moment. It's a very old build, it's a very classic build, and Sniper's doing exactly the same thing. He's just playing standard, straight up, and is doing everything right. He, he's even gone as old school as keeping one in gas, which means that he is looking for a layer timing, eventually. So this is just going to gradually tick over to 100 gas, and it's probably going to go straight into Lair from there. In fact, he's got into uh, full workers right now. So the question is, where does he go from here? What does he want to make this into? This is not a brilliant Mutalisk map, and this is the reason. These missile turrets make things problematic for Mutalisk, but it's not the worst map for it either. It, all these missile turrets really mean is that harassing either this base or the main can be a little bit dangerous because you're driven in directions you don't necessarily want to go in. But he is adding on three more gas, which does indicate he intends to go for the standard double evolution chamber upgrades followed up with Mutalisk, Spyatech, and Ling Baneling on the ground. So we're going to see straight up play from him. What we are actually going to see from Heart is a cloaked Banshee. Now, a Banshee follow-up to Hellions is not that unusual. Putting Cloak in is a little bit strange. Heart is going to... Ooh. Does this Link see it? Oh, man. That actually might be enough of a tell. So that Ling spots a tech lab researching something. Now, that could... That could be Stim. Eh? And he might be thinking that could be Stim. But I have to wonder if he'll pop up a couple of Spore Crawlers. He might be suspicious. Bear in mind his lair came out fairly early as well. This is actually two base Mutalisk. So if you want to talk about old school, this is as old school as it gets. He's made no attempt to take a third. And I kind of like his decision because the third bases on this map can be a bit of a pain. This base right here, which has a lot of mineral patches and some gas, is very exposed. And drops or just even marine pokes from behind can do a lot of damage. This base back here only has six mineral patches and one gas. So... This is going to be interesting, just to go to Spire before taking that third base there. But he will he will go to his third, and he's going to take this one here, which can be a little bit risky. Obviously, it can be sieged up, and all sorts of action can go on there. Here comes the Banshee, and there are Spore Crawlers coming down, but they are going to be a little bit late. This Banshee should also see the Spire, though it depends where exactly he decides to engage. Oh, obviously, is following that one up as well, so it doesn't see the Spire. That's uh, not brilliant for Hart there, but he can expect it. At this point, uh, it, the spy attack is predictable, to say the least. And it's not like he's doing anything weird like going mech here. He's adding more and more barracks. He's getting his marine count up. He's got a viking out as well, which is going to poke back overlords and hopefully ward off the overseer as well. What he hasn't done is stop this creep spread. And that's what worries me a lot. This creep spread is actually getting pretty good. We're seeing like five queens out here for sniper. So his creep spread is awesome. And these Hellions haven't done anything yet. Eh? He didn't follow up with a second reaper. So he didn't try to do any of those reaper hellion pokes. This Banshee is heavily damaged, and it's going to find the third base and do a little bit of damage to that as well. But the Queens will come in and repel it quite easily. And he's got to be careful, because if the Overseer gets in there, a couple of shots will take that Banshee out. So I hope Hart is on the ball here with this, because if he's not, he's going to lose his Banshee. He needs to get out there immediately, and he does. Hart's Banshee control is very good. Sniper, on the other hand, is still he's going strong. Uh, he's got his third base, but it's a bit later. He gets the earlier muters. Will that actually gain him anything? Well, it could. No third base has been taken as of yet. There is a missile turret down here and there. The production looks like it could be camp, but there are a lot of marines out, so I'm not massively concerned for heart right now, but what we are seeing is roaches. Now, this is a really strange composition. I was talking earlier about the idea that this looked super standard for Sniper, but it's not. The order in which he's actually got things is a bit weird, and Muta Roach is a little strange as well. It's not the kind of thing that you would necessarily expect. You would expect Mutaling Baneling. It, oh, Sniper loses several Mutalisks there. Caught out of position as Hart pushes forward. Admittedly, Hart can't push too far forward. He's only got two Marauders, and there's about to be a lot of Speed Roaches, almost 20. The Winter Mines will help out a little bit, but I don't know if he can make this push work at this point. Once the Roaches pop out, he's going to have a nasty surprise. And then he'll come out with speed as well. So suddenly he realizes, oh, there's Roaches. How many more Roaches? There's actually a lot of Roaches. Hart needs to leave, and the Winter Mines get the bad connections there. One does go off on the Muters, which is nice, but Hart cannot fight here. Surely he cannot fight here. He thinks he's got enough firepower, but against that many Roaches, it's going to be a bit difficult. Turns out the muters are down, and he is able to push that back for the time being, but he can't go any further than that. He's going to go to drop into the main base, and that much reduced force should be a tell here for Sniper. Does he have the response? He currently does not. His link count, he doesn't have a link count right now. The roaches are going to be forced to pull back. So this was a nice little clutch move here out of Hart. He's got to watch out for the medevacs. They may get picked off, but there's the turnaround immediately. Hart's going to try and fight as best he can. It stims out and boosts out of the fight, and right back to the army here. 
Lovely control there by Hart, just dropping right below that Mutalisk, taking it out immediately. And things are looking okay for Hart at the moment. The, the decision to go Roaches is now going to be something that Hart can respond to. And the big Roach push didn't come in. He's got 27 Roaches. He's building a few Mutalisks here and there. But Hart realizes what's coming, and now he's going to be able to prepare with more Marauders. And Sniper's still got a really powerful fighting force, but... If we get, well, he's got already got six medevacs. If Hart gets enough medevacs out and gets his upgrades going nicely, which is actually slacking on a little bit here, then he should be able to make this work. There's still no Banelings, so Hart's force is very mobile, and Sniper's isn't. Yeah? Sniper has no way to lock this army down for the moment. He's going to be able to stim as much as it wants. He's going to take the Roach Warren out here, going to just snipe a little bit of key tech. He's trying to bait this army past the Widowmine force, and he will do that, but that could be painful, and it actually hits a bunch of the Terran units here as well, so Hart does have to watch out. Does he have enough units to fight this back. Yes, he does. Sniper is pushed back once again. He is building a Baneling Nest, so Hart's time where he's able to just kind of group up and fight as a big ball is going to be reduced. And Hart is still fighting up against a big army, and this is still two base pressure here from the Terran player. And this is a full three base economy coming out of the Zerg, and no attempt to harass at the back here. In hell, this is actually like a, a fairly low economy three base game from uh, Sniper. He's playing kind of a July Zerg style here with the low economy. And he is doing a decent amount of damage. I mean, he's pushing the enemy back. These Widow Mines are really not doing much. Hart fighting here. He thinks he's got enough. And he's probably right. He does need to watch for the Banelings. But Baneling speed is not done. As long as he doesn't overextend on the creep. And there's no Burrow either. He should be okay. But what's Hart getting done here? He's forcing a lot of units out of his opponent. And that's the key thing here. Three bases with only 55 drones. It's not good saturation. He's got the mobility. He is able to keep pushing. There's no sign of a third base here from Hart whatsoever. He's got a good Marauder count now. So the composition that Sniper has is not going to work, I feel, unless Hart makes a crucial control error. We need to see this combined with Infestors. And we're not getting that. The Banelings go off. They hit the Marauders in the front. That is not something that Hart's too worried about at all. The Muta count is very, very low. It's basically getting nothing done whatsoever. Drops continue. And Hart is spread out and is just trying to make this work. But bear in mind, he's still on two bases. So he needs to decisively hurt Sniper. And he is doing that right now. He has a significant supply lead in terms of army. It's absolutely massive. Hart's been playing a really low economy two base game for 1-1 one, one with Marine Marauder Mine and a lot of medevacs. I mean, this nine medevac count is crippling Sniper's Roach's ability to actually kill stuff. Evolution Chamber's going to go down and we will see the reinforcements cut off here as well. Hart's put a chokehold on Sniper. He's trying desperately to break it, but things are getting worse and worse and worse. Sniper can't tech. Sniper can't build drones. Sniper can only build units. And the units he's building can't fight here. And the drones are now coming off the line. He realizes a couple of decent Baneling hits here. But Hart is looking in a good spot to take this. Oh, no. Good Baneling hit here from Sniper. But the reinforcements are streaming in. And I don't think Sniper lives through this as Hart continues to prosecute this fight. He is burying Sniper here. He is going to take a very belated revenge. And there is the GG. Avenging his loss in Season 1 of Acer Team Story Cup, Hart puts the first one on the board here for Axiom. A two-base build. Pretty cool. Bit of a, a weird, funky build from Sniper that I... I just... I don't really understand why Sniper would go for the Roaches. I think he was trying to hit a timing, and I think he was assuming that Hart was going to be greedy and try to go up to three bases. But the problem is, if the Terran player does not go up the three bases, then your big Roach Hammer gets met with an even bigger Marine Marauder Hammer. And then you're like, oh god, I just invested a bunch of money into this, my economy's behind, my tech's behind, I can't transition, and well, that's that. And Hart brings Axiom ahead, one game to zero versus MVP in this best of seven clan war. What's coming up next? Great matches. That's what I can promise you here. It's going to be Alicia versus Dream on Neo Keru, a... Protoss versus Terran. Right after the break here on MLG TV. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Welcome back to Shoutcraft Clan Wars here on MLG TV. Currently up one game in this best of seven series is Axiom. Sniper trying to go for a bit of a cheeky roach play. And it didn't work. Hart with the two base biomine build was able to soundly crush through that. Although it was a it was a running battle for like ten minutes, but unfortunately it seemed like a a bit of an awkward tech choice. Muta into Roach kind of as a attempt to surprise maybe a three base Terran didn't work out. And now we have the next one. Yes, we have the next one. It's gonna be Alicia versus Dream here on Neo Kero. 
which is probably one of the most straight up the most straight up <laughs> sorry i'm arguing with alicia about dungeon fighter online <laughs> If those who don't know, Alicia is actually not a girl's name, it is the name of an item in Dungeon Fighter, which was one of Alicia's favorite games, and he named his StarCraft persona after that. And I was mentioning to him that uh, Dungeon Fighter is actually coming out again in the US. It was cancelled in the US and then it's now being re-released. And now he says, well now I hate Dungeon Fighter, I play only StarCraft. <laughs> okay, that is fair. Uh, yes, okay, so Alicia confirms ready, dream ready. And then we can get started. He is. All right. Let's rock and roll. Neo Kero. So like I said, very, I wouldn't say a very standard map. It's actually a pretty cool map. I think it could be a ladder map very easily. But it is not a map that has too many really wacky things going on with it. Uh, Wrecking Ball is one of our more unusual maps, even though it doesn't always play out that way because of things like the neutral missile turrets and the tech labs and the high ground natural, which is fairly unusual. And then you got things like Neo Kero, which at first glance look very very standard but not necessarily now some of the bases are a little bit weird to take if it goes past the third base the third base is potentially vulnerable to an attack through the center which is blocked off by rocks it's actually a very nicely designed map in fact the third base can also be harassed from the cliff so there are a number of different choices that you can make to try and take your third base and they all have advantages and disadvantages so it's gonna end up being pretty cool i think and it's always good to watch two skill players on a pretty straight up map anyway, because it's just less gimmicky and it's just raw skill. So here we go, ladies and gentlemen, to the southwest position here on Neo Keru in the Blue Trunks playing Protoss. It is Axiom Alicia versus his opponent to the northeast position in the Red Trunks playing Terran. MVP Dream. I tell you, man, if you had Dream on your Fantasy Pro League team, you'd probably been doing all right for yourself. Dream is a really reliable performer for MVP, more so than... A lot of the star players on that team, you might think, you know, it's very strange to see players like, say, Dongregu or Keen, who you think, yeah, these guys are super solid in every possible way. And then, you know, a player like Dream, who's a bit of a, a younger player, is more consistent in Pro League than they are. You know, he plays really well. I think he's going on my Fantasy Pro League team uh, next season. Probably would be a good idea. I think I need to change up my lineup. My score this season was absolutely terrible. Things were going well, and then I decided to trade out Young for... Maru. Oh, why did I do that? Why? That was a very silly thing to do. Shouldn't have done it! Should have believed in CJ. I don't know why I let that happen. Alright. Gateway coming down here. Dream. What are you doing? Is Dream actually going CC first? This could be a little bit dangerous. This could be very dangerous actually going CC first. I have a feeling that he thinks Alicia would be playing a little bit more passively, but... No, no, he isn't. Not this time. He is going for the gateway first. I mean, it's not the most aggressive build ever, but this allows you to apply pressure. This is going to be annoying. There's no units out. The scout comes out, so Alicia's going to be able to harass this SCV, and I can only imagine that's immediately what he's going to do. But there's no point scouting the main if you know there's a CC first on the way out. I'm actually kind of surprised the Dream is going for this. It's going to cause a number of SCVs to be pulled off the line and that's going to be very annoying to deal with. And there's a gateway coming up. Is, is Alicia actually going to build the Zealot? I think he'll probably just go straight for the Cyber Core and go for a Stalker here, but he sees the CC first going down, and he realizes, you know, I've got to do something about this. Can't just let the Terran player go CC first. There's the double barracks follow-up here. In comes the probe once again to try and harass, and that's going to force another couple of SCVs to come off the line. It's going to be actually a Nexus, so he's going to play a little bit of catch-up from here. And it's going to give him a little bit of a tech advantage. He's going to be able to get units out just a little bit quicker. And he's going to be able to get fancier units out a little bit quicker as well. But, I don't know. A dream is, he's not getting away with it yet. But he has he's going to be able to complete this CC. There obviously has been a lot of harassment from this probe. But there was no Zealot. And it's actually kind of surprising. I thought Alicia would have built the Zealot, honestly. Because he could have done a lot with that. An awful lot with that. That would have really delayed this. But he elected not to. He decided to go for the Nexus and the Cyber Core. That's going to give a slight economic lead here for Dream. Although, Dream was slowed down a little bit. We shouldn't underestimate how important that can be. He's got a lot of injured workers in the back there. Not that, that really matters. They work just as hard as anybody else. But there were workers pulled off the line for a lot of that. So that actually means that the probe count has gone up significantly here for Alicia. And outside of the mules... 
This is going to allow Leisha, once his Nexus is finished, to actually stay on par with Dream. And I think that's why he decided to... Oh, oh. I don't want that. Okay. A bit of a lag spike. We're actually on the Korean server, for those who don't know there, but things are evening out. I think what that allows, and I think this is Alicia's thought process, is that if you force that much lost mining time, and in the background, instead of building units, you actually chrono boost probes, then you actually stay on par with the Terran player. The mules are obviously a factor, and that causes the income to spike, yeah, as you can see. But that's only temporary, and there's still a worker lead here for Alicia, a five worker lead, so that's the logic. For those of you thinking, well, why, why on earth didn't you just build a zealot and attack? The logic is that you actually can keep up at that point. And you also know there's no aggression coming from the Terran, but you have that, that just very slight tech lead because you get your cyber core out earlier and that allows you to unlock buildings like the Stargate, whereas your opponent is going like three raw barracks and is only just building the tech lab and there's no factory down. So he is building against a potential Oracle play by the looks of it. He's built his engineering bay up very early. He's getting stim. He will most likely, well, I mean, he's already in the mineral line. He knows and this Oracle might not end up doing an awful lot as a result. A missile turret's coming down. It's not a brilliant map for Oracles at the best of times, honestly. And Dream will have to deal with an annoying Stalker. And this, of course, can be microed seven ways from Sunday. So he needs to watch out for that. But I think Dream is set up. He's just got the right number of Marines here. He puts six in the mineral line, which is enough to kill off a Oracle. And there's no missile turrets coming down here. I think he's not... I don't think this Oracle's going to get much done at all, honestly. But it does you know, keep his opponent honest. We'll have to see. He can always backstab with it a little bit later on. But there's enough Marines here out of Dream to fend off any kind of Oracle play. And there's the Twilight Council follow-up here with the Robo. So Alicia lately has been favoring against Terran a lot of two-base blink. And that goes pretty well. And he'll get to two-base blink in different ways. Like, he doesn't just necessarily rush it. He just gets two-base blink and it works for him and he does a great amount of damage with it his blink control is very very good few scvs killed only two it's not enough to justify that oracle as of yet uh, that that tech delayed this twilight council it delayed the robo it costs money it costs gas so far it hasn't really got much done it may be able to do something a little bit later on of course missile turrets are coming out from dream so he had to build those he knows now that there's an oracle but even then uh, is it enough I think he has to get a couple more SCVs, and then he can say, you know what, I forced a couple of missile turrets out of you, your engineering bay had to go down earlier, your starport's later, your tech's later, so I can justify what I just did. At the moment, I don't think he can, but he does gain that map control, and he keeps Dream in his base. I wonder if we'll see a third base out of Alicia. Protoss players have been doing that quite a bit on this. Ooh, he manages to find a way in and gets two SCVs, delaying these two barracks, which is... Quite surprising. I mean, the marine coverage from Dream here is really good. And Stim is about to finish. So he actually can't keep doing this. And if he doesn't realize, he's probably going to lose this Oracle. But he picks off two more SCVs. And I think that Oracle... No, it's going to get away. Oracles are pretty fast. We do keep forgetting that. They're quick. So that Oracle, I think, has now paid for itself. Seven kills, delaying on the barracks, and just being generally irritating. So where does Alicia go with here? He's actually going for... Instead of Blink, he's going for a Warp Prism, which is up here with Zealots in it. He's going for Charge, and he's going for Immortals. As it stands, Dream does have Marines in the base. But bear in mind, this Oracle will be able to help. If he's able to drop those Zealots very quickly... I wonder if he'll wait for Charge for this, actually. Yeah, it looks like he will. He's going to keep this in the corner. What is Dream doing in the back of this? He's playing very standard. He is going for reasonably upgrade heavy. You know, he's getting his... comp combat shields and his concussive shells he wants to have this big powerful bio force and right now alicia doesn't really have much but that's actually okay because dream's not being able to harass and think about this for a second the first medevacs are just coming out at 10 and a half minutes so any kind of early push he could do didn't happen and now as he moves out which alicia can see well, as you know, he's, he has kept an eye on that he's going to be able to do the warp prism drop if he wants and do some damage charge is going to be done There'll be a photon overcharge available, so Alicia should be able to hold this, but that is a lot of guns coming out of out of Dream, there's no doubt. A lot of Marines, a lot of Marauders, very Marauder heavy actually, which is potentially very good for Alicia because he is going for charging Zealots. Although the Storm is not going to be as effective, and you can kite a small number of charging Zealots thanks to Concussive Shell. I think Alicia does have to go for this drop though, and if he wants to do it, he has to kind of do it now. If he delays too much longer, there he goes, but... This, I think, yeah, I, I, is there a Mothership call for Alicia? Yeah, of course there is, there should be. Where is it? 
I'm actually not sure where it is. All right, it's got... Okay, well, there's the force field, so not too many problems there. Dream's slowly getting himself through. There's the photo nope charge coming in, and the warp prism drop right into that mineral line with the charging zealot is dealing some significant economic damage. But Dream has broken through, and he's going to try and take that Nexus out. And honestly, not a great engagement from Alicia thus far. He needs to try and save the Nexus. He's bringing in the Zealots from all sides. The Immortals are actually out of position. They're stuck behind the army. And Dream looks like he has enough guns to break through this. Can Alicia actually hold on to this Nexus while it drops behind? It looks like he just barely can. And Dream does not want to fight, but he is pulling back and he's going to go for it again. Another warp incoming in from Alicia here. How much damage was done? 20 workers killed. A huge economic blow dealt to the Terran player. And I have a feeling Alicia is now going to stabilize quite nicely because I don't think Dream has enough to break this. The Mothership Core did die, though, and it had energy for another photon overcharge. So Dream wants this Nexus dead. Storm is done. The Immortals being up there with the Charging Zealots, however... I don't think Dream can break it. He is going for Ghosts off of this, but he's still doing it off two bases and 35 SCBs versus 50 probes here for Alicia. Drops coming in, though. Alicia needs to respond to this. He does have this Oracle in position, which will be absolutely perfect. He brings it in, and this Oracle actually can kill this, and he should deal with it, but right now he's trying to deal with the attack at the front. This Oracle could just, she could just go. It could just go, but it didn't. Alicia kind of getting stretched thin here by Dream's multitasking, but so far Alicia is holding on. Archon morphed at the front here. Dream trying to make this work. Really good control here by Dream. Honestly, bringing in the reinforcements from the back and taking good fights. The drop behind there is going to do some economic damage here as well. He's pulling the force of Alicia apart with a very small army. Very Maru-esque play coming out of Dream right here. Really impressive control. The warp prism is back in the mineral line though. More zealots are coming in to wreck dream's economy and dream can't keep sustaining these losses if he does he will not be able to build those ghosts and alicia has not taken economic damage he can keep walking in finally dream is able to get behind that mineral line alicia needs to respond to that immediately a couple of zealots won't be enough three might be though and zealots caught a, kind of caught out of position really marauder heavy style here from dream working out well for him 27 workers killed right now it's 34 versus 42 but alicia has taken economic damage and he's maybe not taking these fights as well as he can do he is losing in his main base He's getting... St look at this. The these actually dropped in a position where the Zealots can't get at them. That's unbelievable when you look at it. But the Zealot is finally warped in and will be able to deal with that. But, I mean, that was an amazing drop to just find that tiny little space where Zealots couldn't even reach. Really great decision-making here from Dream. Dream's still hammering forward. He's managing to even up the mineral line. He's managing to even up the mineral count. There are now six ghosts. That's a lot of ghosts. Alicia could be in trouble here in a really big way. The amount of damage that was done to Dream looked significant, but Dream has really managed to get back into this in a big way. There is the huge, absolutely huge EMP. The Archons trying to make their way through here. There's so little left for the Protoss. There's the Stim forward. The Immortal is going to get caught out. More Charging Zealots coming in, and they're going to try and get on top of it, but it's not enough. GG, Dream makes it happen. So, so well played there by Dream. I've got to say, really great control. Absolutely fantastic with his Bioforce. And Alicia was looking great for the longest time. That War Prison drop did a huge amount of damage, but he didn't take efficient engagements. He was he never rebuilt his Mothership Core, which is something that Alicia frequently makes the mistake of doing. And Dream was able to make it happen. Really well played. Absolutely fantastic. All right, one apiece. I told you we're gonna go Clan War. I wasn't lying. This is already turning out to be absolutely electrifying. What will we see next? Yet more greatness. Impact versus Super, a Zerg versus Protoss on Fallen Dreams, coming up right after the break. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Shoutcraft Clan Wars here on MLG TV. The next match is about to begin. We had an electrifying opening, and it's currently one apiece, which frankly is the way that even though I'm obviously biased towards Axiom and I'd love us to win, I want to see this go all the way to seven games because the caliber of play on display is excellent. Dream just playing like a man on fire there, taking huge amounts of economic damage, but through excellent control, micro, constant aggression, huge amounts of awesome multitasking, and the ability to make great decisions like that tiny little drop into that one space where the charging zealots couldn't reach was what gave, gave him the victory. It allowed him to stabilize and build up the ghost count, which would allow him to win that fight. Dream is so, so good. So, ladies and gentlemen, now we have a Zerg versus Protoss in the northeast position in the blue trunks, a playing Zerg. Recent Dreamhack finalist for Axiom. It is Impact. 
versus his opponent to the southwest position. In the red trunks, playing Protoss, MVP Super. With his Lotum clan tag there. So unofficial clan in Korea. As I asked them last time, I was like, what is Lotum? Is it some kind of game? No, it's, a, it's actually an unofficial clan that these guys like to hang out in. They're also, of course, members of a pro team called MVP. Could not be more appropriate considering we are playing the clan wars right here. Okay. Zerg versus Protoss on Fallen Dreams. Now, we've done quite a lot of clan wars. We've obviously done 20 plus of these things. I don't remember a Zerg versus Protoss on this map, honestly. So, this is a difficult thing to figure out. You see a decent amount of ZBZ going down on Fallen Dreams. Understandably so, since it is a map where you are dealing with these bridges in the center that retract and extend every 30 seconds. So, the only other way to get around them is to use fast units. And, of course, what's fast? Well, Zerglings. So, we see a lot of players just build Zerglings, move around the side, and, of course, set up things like Baneling attacks. We're going to see Super go Nexus first here. Hatch first coming in from Impact. I wonder if Impact will actually go three hatch before pool. I wonder if he will. If he doesn't, then this Nexus first play by Super is really good because it's unlikely that we're going to be able to see Impact actually respond to it. He's going... Is he going gas before pool? All right. Okay, so this is actually still a fairly economically greedy build here from Impact. And his pool is going to be on 17. I mean, it doesn't get any greedier than that. So it's not not disastrous to see the Protoss player manage to get down a Nexus first. It's great for Super. But Impact didn't play in a way where he was worried about kind of early aggression. He went greedy. He got his gas really early on, which means he's going to be able to get speed really early and his lair quicker as well and tech up. And then he got his spawning pool on 17, which is about as late as you can ever get it unless you are going three hatch before pool. So it's okay. It's not too shabby. But what I want to see here from Super is what kind of tech choice he's going to go with because we don't see that many Protoss on this map. Right, the last one that I remember was actually in control playing on this map, and that was a long, long time ago, a couple of months back. So it's not a common choice for Protoss players at all. They much prefer different maps. They like to go on places like Neo Jungle Valley. That's very Protoss heavy. And New Polaris Rhapsody, also very Protoss heavy. Not on Fallen Dreams, though. So I wonder what this build's going to be. Going to see six things, of course, out of impact. And the Double Queens and immediately going into speed. Which is, is kind of cool, but you got to bear in mind this, ex this expansion is not really a pocket. It's kind of a semi-pocket expansion. You can access it from this area right here, but this area can also be very easily walled off with the forge cannons and things like that. The back rocks can be destroyed, but they do take a lot of work. Uh, these are three armor rocks at 2,000 health, so lings take a lot of time to make their way through here. Impact scouts, he sees, all right, Nexus first. All right, well, so where do I go from here? Super's going to start this wall off. It's a fairly narrow choke, so doing runbys here can be a bit risky, to say the least. Ling's now on the way. Impact is... Gonna have a quick look and see what happens with this. He might be able to get past, actually. We'll see. There's a sentry on the way and a zealot, so maybe. Speed is about to be done. He's building a lot more links. He really wants to commit to getting past here. If he doesn't, this is actually gonna suck because he is way behind. Look at it. He's only on 20 drones, so he's dedicating to a massive amount of speed links, and he needs to do damage with this. Uh oh! Uh oh! Oh no! Impact! Oh, the links fall to their doom. Lost three lings on the bridge. That kind of sucks. Speed is about to be done, but I don't know. Super hasn't walled off yet, but I'm concerned that he is going to. I mean, he's got to first. Yeah, here come the two gateways. If his lings don't get in now, then getting through this back rock, this back rock is going to be basically impossible because of the mothership core. So I'm, I don't know what impact is doing, but he is way behind in every way. These lings are going to get nothing done. I can't imagine anyway. As soon as Super realizes the back rocks are being attacked, he'll just move his mothership core in and that's going to be that. So what, I mean, what's the plan here? What was Impact's idea? I don't know, but whatever it was, it's not going to work. And Super is way ahead now. He's got everything he could possibly need. He, if Impact had actually made a run by with all of his lings over there, he might have got through. He's going to try and pressure the front. And he does have a lot of Zerglings. If he can break it, that will be great. But there's two sentries behind this. Uh, there's, no, under no, there's no possibility of this being broken. It would require a massive mistake from Super to allow that to happen. So, Impact's in a horrible spot. There's not even a, another way to look at it. His position here is terrible. He went for a build that relied on Super not walling off this area here, which obviously was going to happen. 
I don't know where he goes from here. He's building roaches and he's trying to take a third base, but he's so far behind. Yeah, this is this is pretty bad. And now there's uh, there's immortals coming out. Super basically has impact number in a huge way here. It's going to be seven gate, two base, immortals, immortal sentry all in by the looks of it. So I mean, this should crush impact. It would require impact to pull off some amazing moves to fend that off. We'll see. There's a warp prism coming in as well. So. Yep, so a whole lot of useless speedlings at the moment. As long as he doesn't lose too many more of them, he can use them in the fight to come, but... It's a... It's a immortal sentry all in. What's he gonna do with it? If he gets caught out here... No! I, oh, that's so dicey. To even attempt to do something like that. It's, looks like he's just trying to distract his opponent. He knows now that there's... It's, sent, it's gotta be sentry immortal all in. There's no doubt about it, so... Impact has gotta try and get out of here. He needs to start building units. Oh, he gets on top of the sentries, but... Gets nothing done at... Moment of indecision that I don't really know what he was doing. He just lost about 20 Zerglings. He got in there, and then he pulled his units away. I, I, I just think Impact dies here, straight up. I don't like calling fights before they're done, but Impact could not have botched this any harder if he tried. So, this is going to be a massacre. Oh, what's up with that? It's weird. You know, we don't generally see Impact play like that. It's a little bit strange, but... Again, if he holds this, it will be a bit of a Christmas miracle. He might be able to do a run by passed into the base, but no, there's a Sentry and Zealot already there. There's no way in a million years. Well, we're going to have to see whether or not... That's a decent amount of force fields are actually wasted there. These guys are actually kind of low on energy, so... There is the possibility, but Impact is going to delay it. I think he's got to sacrifice his third base. I don't think there's any way that that third base stays up. <coughs> if we can somehow get at the Immortals. I mean, there are only two of them. Then it might work out, but... Let's see. All right, roaches are coming in, and the queen already dead. Where are the lings? Where are the lings? What? I don't know where the lings are. They're not here. There aren't any. Okay, so, well, impact's dead. <laughs> GG. That was really atrocious. I've got to be honest with you. That was absolutely atrocious from impact. Not sure what was going on there. Weird decision to try and go for the speedling attack there. He notices the Nexus first and it's like, alright, I'm gonna build a bunch of links and do what with them? That's not gonna do anything. Even if he was able to break through the back rocks, it would have taken him so long to do it. So I'm not really sure what was going through his mind or what his strategy was there. Maybe it was just reliant on his opponent not going for a Nexus first. But even if it had been a Forge expand, that Ling attack wouldn't have worked. I mean, that map is just easy to wall off. There's no way speedlings work there. I, I don't know. That was just really weird. And Super was completely dominant 100% of the match. Not even a doubt about that. All right, folks. 2-1 here for MVP. And we'll be right back after the break. Going to be switching on our overlay so that we can go over to the 2v2, which will be Impact playing again with Crank versus Dong Ray Goo and Keen. Don't go anywhere. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Shoutcraft Clan Wars. As you can hear in the background, the next game is about to begin. And it's going to be a 2v2. Crank and Impact taking on Dong Ray Gu and Keen. I am interested to see what kind of build that Crank and Impact have brought here. MVP has come up with a really nice build for this map. Putting a Protoss and a Zerg up against a fairly you know, predictable composition here from MVP is a bit weird. And it indicates to me that they have something up their sleeve. So I want to see what that is, and hopefully it's good. As we said, we have 2-1 down here for Axiom after Impact's build just completely fell flat on its face. He unfortunately has a small injury that he incurred in the last few days of exercise. He's actually going to the hospital about it tomorrow. He injured his wrist. However, that's got nothing to do with your build. So, you know, I will not make excuses for my own players, as you're well aware. But the 2v2 begins, and it's a very unusual composition here out of Axiom. What can they make happen with it? In the Red Trunks, playing Protoss. As you can see, we have Crank. And his teammate, playing Zerg in the Blue Trunks, it's Impact. Versus their opponents, from Team MVP. <laughs> to the west of Sacred Path, in the light Blue Trunks, it's Dong Rei Gu. Alongside his teammate, the one and only Commander Keen in the Purple Trunks playing Terran. Okay. What on earth is this composition and what are they doing with it? A Zerg and a Protoss on a 2v2 map. When... What's the time of that spawning pool? That's a 10 pool. Okay, so Impact's going to get aggressive immediately. What happens here for MVP? Because MVP did come up with a rather interesting build the last time. 
Will they do the same thing again? Looks like they will not. So what we saw what the previous time we watched MVP go for a really weird build, it was they would proxy a barracks around here, and then they would put a bunker here for control. They'd knock the rocks down almost nothing. They'd use it to as a staging point to push across the map, and then they would be able to pull back behind the rocks. But they haven't done anything of the sort this time. And I think the reason they haven't done that is because they see a Protoss player. And really, Protoss rush potential is not that great. There's not a lot that a Protoss player can actually do. What they can do is provide a very good defensive opening if they decide to create a forge and cannon wall off here. But Impact's gone for a 10 pull, which indicates that he wants to get aggressive almost immediately. So what exactly is going to happen? Crank is going to proxy a pylon over here. And Dongregu has not seen that. He's looking through the center. It's like, well, what on earth are you up to? He's probably not going to be able to scout that. Keen's actually scouting here as well. What is that proxy for? I do wonder. I mean, if he gets really quick warp gate tech, he can actually warp past the rocks. That's something you can do, but I don't know. This is this is all so, so very odd. Although Dongwegu, eh, he, do, he is going to end up seeing the probe, and I wonder if that's going to prompt him to look for something. In fact, the probe actually went back up as well. Hmm. What is he going to build with this? Is it going to be additional gateways? Will he proxy gateways and just push out from there? Is that what is that what is going to happen? Impact's bringing in his lings right now. Dongwei Gu is going for an expansion and actually has gone really late on his speed lings. I wonder where Impact actually wants to go. There's a full wall off here. He can't attack this. Impact has got to go and attack Dongwei Gu. And it's going to be a proxy Stargate out of Crank, which as it stands remains unscouted. So that's going to be an interesting one. But these links will not make their way past here. So I don't exact. I mean, Impact has got to confirm what's there. As soon as he sees the wall, he should just back off immediately. And it's unfortunate. If he'd actually gone for DRG, he could have done some damage and maybe forced a cancel on the hatchery. But he didn't. So Impact kind of rolls the dice and ends up in the wrong place. But this proxy Stargate could do quite a bit. Dongrei Gu is keeping an eye on things, but he doesn't really know what's going on. He's got to suspect that there's some kind of proxy tech, but there's no engineering bay up. The bunker is going up here for Keen. A proxy oracle could deal huge damage to Keen's mineral line, and that is his only base, so that could be absolutely huge. Let's see, a star pocket down. The bunker has now been cancelled. Lings are on the way. Impact's making his way across the map, and he wants to apply a little bit of pressure here to Dongwei Gu. And speed is about to be done, but Impact is not going to win this fight. Uh, he's got to realize that. He gets speed just at the right time and is able to pull back, but he is bringing in a few more units. Impact with a nice catch right there. Gets a Hellion. Jams it against the wall. And here comes the Proxy Oracle. There's no defense against this at all. The Lings are now making their way in. Impact trying to duel here with Dong Regu. Not able to do it. Now Crank goes right into that mineral line. And is able to get only two SCVs up to this point. He actually does have... Uh, uh, the miscontrol there. If he had been able to get a, a full-on fire against... That's not even a real sentence. If he'd been able to focus fire properly on the Lings, he would have been in a pretty good spot there. Lings? What? I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if they, if he got a proper focus fire on the Marines, then that would have been great, but he didn't. The Oracle comes in to reinforce, and we have a bit of a scrap in the middle here going on between all forces. There's that single heli in here from Keen. The uh, Oracle is coming in to try and help out, and the Stalker's coming in to back this up as well, and it does look like the Protoss and Zerg team here for Axiom are able to push back their opponents. Another Oracle is coming out here from Crank as well. I would be surprised to not see a Viking from Keen pretty shortly, but what is Crank and what's Crank going to be able to do? What's Impact going to be able to do? Bear in mind, Dongregu is on two bases, and Dongregu's economy is, well, actually terrible, but it can be a lot better. He has two bases. A lot of speedlings coming out from DRG. He's able to produce a lot at a time, and the army from Axiom is smaller, but it is higher tech. So what exactly will these oracles do? Second oracle is about to finish. And with the anti-air, that also means that overlords are going down left, right, and center. Who do they attack? Who do they go for? They're trying to figure it out. Impact with a smaller link force here, but he does have stalkers and oracles coming in to back this up. So DRG doesn't want to fight underneath that. Crank looks like he wants to try and push onto the Terran player, which I think is the right call right now. Keen doesn't actually have all that much. He is going for drop capability, but... Oh, the Viking is out here for Keen, and it's going to start picking away at this. Crank has got to kill that Viking immediately, otherwise he will lose those Oracles. In fact, that one is probably going to die to a Queen if he goes in too far. He's chasing this down, which is a huge risk. He wants to just try and take out some more Lings with it. Crank's not actually building anything right now, and he's not he's going to lose that, but he wants to push in here. And the single Viking is now sort of out of position, not able to do anything. And now the army comes down, but there's so many Lings coming out here from Dongrei Gu. 
There's no energy here on the Oracles. They're not going to be able to do anything. Keen brings in the reinforcements from the back, and Dong Rei Gu, on his own pretty much, with just a little help from his friends, is going to crush this entire attack here. Just devastating, and I think a massive amount of indecision here from the Axiom team. I'm not really sure what their strategy was, but going for Oracles and then doing nothing, and there's the GG. And MVP demolishes Axiom completely in the 2v2. Sorry, pressing the wrong button once again. My apologies. I, I can see where that... I can see what the strategy was for, but it just didn't do anything. I would have... If, if Impact had hit Dong Gu quicker, then he would have been able to do some damage because Dong Gu got really, really greedy. The Oracles only killed two SCVs and then pulled away and didn't do anything else. With the second Oracle, he could have got back in and completely destroyed the economy of the Terran player very easily. They had indecision. They didn't know where to go. I think they should have actually gone and attacked Keen. They, he had enough stalkers to break that front line to allow the Lings in. But he allowed Dong Rei Gu just to build up a large army. And that was that. You know, it was disorganized, frankly, from Axiom. And they didn't seem to know what they were doing. And now it's three games to one in favor of MVP, which is absolutely not where you want to be at all. At all. No way. Just, just devastating. They're going to have to, of course, win every game now to bring it to the ace match. And the next matchup is going to be Ryung taking on Billowy on Neo Jungle Valley. And that's a game he could very well lose. Billowy's very good. We will see. Will they be able to come back here, or will this be a solid trouncing at the hands of MVP? We'll find out shortly. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Shoutcraft Clan Wars right here on MLG TV. And Axiom are in a serious amount of trouble as MVP have taken them apart. And frankly, not even due to amazing play from MVP, Axiom just have looked unprepared throughout this series. The strategy that they had in the 2v2 was very odd, and I think it would have worked if it was properly executed, but it wasn't. And a lot of indecision from the Axiom team in the 2v2 resulted in a straight-up loss and some very weird play from Impact as well basically doomed him from the very outset with speedlings against an immortal sentry all-in from a nexus first so this has not been brilliant thus far for axiom heart had a really strong start alicia played well but was overcome by dream and now we have ryung who has been in a slump for a little while although he is starting to climb back out of it indeed he was the one who defeated the eventual dream eventual dreamhack champion life a dreamhack book arrest He's going up against Billowy, who, as we have seen in the previous Pro Leagues, has been able to all kill. He is damn good. He is certainly underrated. And Ryung has been struggling a bit against Protoss lately. So, we'll see if Ryung has come up with anything. I certainly hope he has, because if he has not, this will be a swift defeat here for Axiom. And that would be their third loss in the Clan Wars with no wins on the board. That would actually put them, I think, right at the bottom of the table, along with Root, which is not really where you want to be. Not that anyone... Not that we dislike Root. Oh, we'd share a house with Root, absolutely, but Axiom certainly were hoping to perform a heck of a lot better, especially considering they are GSL champions, and up to this point, they haven't really been able to do so. All right, folks, here we go, and I apologize for the incorrect overlay. Didn't get a chance to reset that, so you're going to have to deal with the old school for the time being. To the southwest position in the Red Trunks are playing Terran. It's Axiom Ryung, who could potentially be the last man standing against this man right here for team mvp to the southeast position in the yellow trunks playing protoss it is billowy a strange name honestly very strange name we often joke that koreans just pick an english sounding name that they like or they just pick it they because it sounds cool to them uh, it's, it's definitely not all that intimidating is it you can understand people picking sniper oh, that's that's intimidating something along those lines or killer but billowy, not exactly. It's like, well, there's a bit of a breeze going on. So you better make sure that your bird feed is on properly. Otherwise, it might get blown off. It's not really that intimidating. But billowy is no slouch. He is amazing. He's been putting on some really great performances in Pro League for Team MVP. I would not be messing with him. So, Ryung is going to have to play very well in order to make his way out of this. He is going to open up with a barracks first, so I imagine he wants to open Reaper. We don't see a lot of Terran on this map, but Reaper is really good because it allows for the Terran player to scout, whereas otherwise, on a semi-island map, it's very difficult for the other player to scout. Billowy is not going to open up Nexus first, and I think he realizes that there is the very real possibility of a Reaper opening, so he wants to get a gateway out first because he needs to get his Mothership Core. He needs to be able to get his Cybercore up and start to get his 
Stalkers out. Because it's possible, and we've actually seen Jack G pull this off on this map before against Prodos. It was against Crank, actually, I think, to great effect. I think it was Crank? Yeah. Sorry, there's been so many Clan Wars, I forget. But he did pull it off against Protoss player. He went for double racks, double reaper into four reapers into just ruining the Protoss player. And Billowy does not want to repeat that mistake. And there's the Nexus coming down now. But now that the gateway's up, he will be able to build a Zealot. He can follow up with the Cyber Core, and that allows him to get his Mothership Core or Stalker. Should be easy enough. Here's the Reaper coming out of Ryung. Of course, Ryung doesn't know where his opponent is yet. He did send an SCV out there. Just to have a look, just to see maybe if he could see something, but that didn't happen, so. Unfortunate, but never mind. The Reaper will take a little bit of time to find his opponent, and by that time, there should be either a Mothership Core or a Stalker well on the way, so the Reaper is not expected to do damage here. That's not really a problem. There's the CC, so we're going to see the Reactor into Expand, which is very, very standard in this matchup. And Ryong's going to scout the right place first, which is great. That means he will actually get into the base. The Mothership Core does Chrono out very quickly. He might get a probe out of this, he might not, but it's unlikely, to say the least, that the Reaper is going to get killed. Uh, Billy with a good control there. A little bit of wasted mining time, not huge. Ryong, of course, just wants to poke away, and now he realizes, all right, you got Mothership Core out. I see. Engineering Bay from Ryong very early. I have a feeling he is expecting oracles, and I don't blame him. This is a map where airplay is really good for Protoss for obvious reasons. It's good for everybody, but Protoss just happened to have some of the more devastating options. So I imagine he's playing safe here. But the thing is, he's got a Reaper in the base, and he knows right now that there is no Stargate. But he wants to try and make sure that there never is. Once the Stalker's out, he can't keep the Reaper around. So he knows that, and he is going to have to... Just keep an eye out and make sure that his opponent doesn't try to sneak a Stargate in. And there is one. It's actually at the back. Will it be scouted? Nope. Does it matter? Actually, not that much. Because Ryung went for an engineering bay early on. Which, again, most pro players do not do that. But I think Ryung is almost convinced that there is going to be a Stargate coming out. He's going for a really early plus one. Which is... That's an interesting build. It's not completely unheard of, but on a map like this... You've got to bear in mind that he has no starport, no factory tech at all. But he's going for plus one. And he will eventually get stim as well. He's going to scout the Stargate, so he knows exactly what's coming here. That plus one is a really strange upgrade. It will, you know, this sounds stupid, but it will actually let him get through the rocks a hell of a lot faster. Significantly quicker, in fact. But it would also make him kind of not as susceptible to multiple oracles. But the plus one is not going to be done before the first oracle hits. Plus one is not that long an upgrade, as you can see. It's over halfway done already. But it may, it may, if, especially if Billowy is not too quick with this. Bear in mind, Billowy doesn't actually know where his opponent is with this Oracle. He's going to check close by air first. And actually, by the time the Oracle gets there, the plus one might be done. Think about this conventionally, right? How many Marines does it take to beat an Oracle most of the time? He's going, I think he's going cross. He is going cross. No, no, he's not. Okay, turn around. Plus one might be done by the time this hits. So, traditionally, it takes six marines to kill an oracle. With plus one, it takes a lot less than that. But the fact of the matter is the plus one's not going to be done. So, Billowy scouted the right position first. And there are more marines coming up. And he already gets the shots off. So, so far, this oracle has done nothing. And Ryung has been doing a good job of fending it off. And, wow, if that oracle even tries to engage... Oh, Billowy's so close. That would have been brutal. A second upgrade coming out here. What is Ryung's game? He is putting another barracks down here. He hasn't got another starport as of yet. And you can't really be aggressive on this map unless you bring the rocks down. With plus one, he has the chance of doing that. But with the Oracle out, of course, he doesn't want to try and move out as he would take damage. But any the Oracle has done nothing up to this point. Bear that in mind. But it has allowed behind this for a lot of tech to go down. Here come the Marines. They do have that plus one upgrade. There is a revelation. It's like, hey, yeah, I just want to have a look and see what you're doing. So this oracle has, up to this point, done nothing. Of course, there's no second oracle coming out here. Billowy is going for, I wow, 8-gate... Is that 8-gate Storm? No, it's 8-gate Zealot Archon by the looks of it. Okay. Well, that's that's hefty. And the, the tech is, of course, a little bit behind here. This oracle is somehow not dying. <laughs> Ryung has rolled out, and... He might be able to get this Oracle. Will Billowy turn it around in time? No, he's getting the Oracle nice and easy. And I think Ryung does want to try and hit before something helps. It will actually be Storm and not Zealot Archon. Of course, it's both. I mean, once you use it, you morph the Zealotin. But surprisingly enough, there's already plus two armor coming out here from Billowy, who's just been working on armor upgrades. He hasn't got attack upgrades. 
as he knows his opponent's very marine heavy. And Ryung wants to hit this timing, but I don't think he can. And Storm is on the way. It won't be done before Ryung's army gets through, but I mean, this is much delayed because of the rocks you have to knock down. But there's eight gates. And I think that's that might just in itself be enough to push this back, especially when the medevac count is so damn low. Uh, I don't know about this build. I guess we'll find out. Army supply is currently in favor of Ryung, but we are talking about a Terran player attacking a Protoss that has a full mothership core's worth of energy. Is he going to get much done with this? It's a, it's a strange, aggressive strategy that on a map like this is very counterintuitive. And I almost feel like it's kind of counter meta. I, I have a feeling that maybe he was thinking, oh, well, you know, there's going to be a third base. But he could have confirmed that. He has the Reaper. I don't see... I don't think this will work, but you never know. I don't know. There's, four, there's 14 Zealots with... Uh, they don't have plus two army yet, though. So, we actually has an upgrade leader. I guess we're about to find out. Will he be able to dodge the storms? Yes. Initially, he can. He takes out another Templar. Gets out of there. The photo Nova charge is now done, though. Let's see a third CC come down. I think Ryung realizes, okay, right, well, that's not going to work out. But I think, he, I mean, he got a Templar out of that. He is still being aggressive. There is one Templar behind that, but it doesn't have enough energy for Storm. So Ryung could actually take a fight here if he wants to, but I don't think he knows. So it's, it's an odd build, but he is taking a third behind it. So, okay, I, I guess it, it's okay. He's slightly behind in terms of workers, but that's made up for very easily by the double mule. So... That's not really worth worrying about. Ryung's still sharking around trying to poke his opponent. Billowy does have a lot of gates. Bear in mind, he hasn't taken a third. And Ryung's going to confirm that that's the case and say, right, well, that's a lot of zealots. This is clearly a two-base play. You're not expanding. I'm taking a third base. I need to be able to hold that third base. And he does need to be able to hold it. And I'm worried for him now because Billowy's army supply is now taking the lead. And we are talking about plus two charging zealots against 1-1, one, one, which is okay, but plus two armor, that's four armor against zealots, against marines, sorry, who are going to be hitting for like seven. Ryung's looking for a drop here. This is extremely risky. He is fortunate that there is no observer there. If there was, then this would be potentially disastrous, but it might be required. I'm just, well, there's going to be a third base behind it. Okay, so Billowy has also made the decision. You know what? I don't want to attack. This, third, this actually puts Ryung in a great spot. Because that third is going down. But he still is going to have to deal with this really large Zealot army. This drop could do damage. There is a Templar and a Cannon, though. In fact, there's two Templar. This actually would be a disaster if Ryung tries to do this. I really hope he scans to see this. Because if he doesn't, this could hurt a lot. It seems to be a two-pronged attack. But there's there's no way. He can't do it. He might be able to get some good shots off here. Maybe snipe a Templar or two. But he's going to go in. This is almost suicidal. But Billowy didn't respond. Billowy too slow. And he was too focused on fighting this, which actually allowed the drop to come in. In theory, that drop should have never worked, but now it is in. There is a big storm going down the center there. Second storm coming in as well. The Metamax are not healing. They need to be in position here. Ryung trying to fight on two fronts. This drop gets nothing done, really. And these Metavax are probably going to get feedbacked on the way out here as well. This is not as disastrous as it looks. I mean, Ryung's supply is actually still pretty good, but it's mostly in Metavax. He's got 10 Metavax and no units. He realizes this and knows he needs to get more barracks. Will Billowy actually get aggressive? I don't think... May I, I, maybe he won't. You know, if he leaves, there is the potential for drops. It's obviously been demonstrated that Billowy can be dropped, even though he has that defense. This Zealot Ball is huge, but Ghost Academy is on the way. If Ryung can hold on, he'll be in a good spot. He still has the army supply lead, and he has a significant economic advantage over his opponent. If Billowy continues to play passively, then Ryung should be in a good spot. He's up with upgrades now. He actually has the same amount of upgrades as the Protoss player. He is upgrading two upgrades at once, so he's going to have an upgrade advantage if he continues to survive here. Warp Prism's on the way, though. Billowy is not going to be playing passively all the time. He wants to harass. He should be able to do that. There are a lot of units being rallied out, though, so I don't necessarily see that doing too much. But it depends. You know, those are damaging, charging zealots. They could do a lot. Oh, oh, Ryung, Ryung, gotta watch out with the Metavax here. They could very easily get stormed, feedbacked, Archon, or whatever they want. There's the scan going down here. The, oh, Widow Mines, huge detonations. Massive. Now, of course, he has to deal with this, but that's gonna get shut down, no problem. Viking takes that out. Ryung's looking okay here. Billowy's been playing a little bit passively. Most of the harass has been shut down. How much damage was done? Billowy was able to kill 11 workers with the storm drop, and that puts, it puts Ryung a bit behind. He does have the mules to compensate for that. 
But is that game-winning damage? No, it's not. And Ryung continues to fight. He's bringing ghosts into the mix. He has Widow Mines. He was able to get good connections the last time. He does a scan. He wants to kill that Observer. I think that that's not going to happen. Billowy's going to bait him in if he tries that. This is a nasty place to go through. Widow Mine is going down here. And another big shot goes off. Just, I think, just fired off and actually hit. Oh, the Templar! One, two, three go down. Ryung takes some damage, but that was a great fight. And Ryung is now in a good spot. But he's still fighting through this nasty choke with Archons. But he's looking good. He continues to push forward. Ryong wants to make this happen. Another storm goes down. Doesn't do a huge amount of damage. Second storm on the right flank. Kills a couple of marines here and there. But Ryong's army is still looking good. He's about to have plus two. He is working on plus three. He now has ghosts on the field. Widowmines getting deployed. One goes down. Second one goes down. The zealots got to get hit by the Widowmines yet again. Another storm. Ryong is able to dodge out of it. Eats another storm though. Ryong still with the lead here. And this, this ghost just wishes he was never born at this point. But Ryung wants to make this work. He has the economy. He has the upgrades. Plus two is about to finish. Plus three is on the way. Billowy is stuck against the corner here. Off goes the EMP. Ryung says this is time. He goes for it. The Zealots at the front getting absolutely decimated. The plus two armor helping out an awful lot against them. The Colossus still at the back though. Ryung is going to have to micro against this. The meat shield is gone. Ryung needs to stim forward. He's got to destroy Billowy's army now. He can't allow reinforcements to come in. He knows it. He goes in again. There's the GG and Ryung manages it. He pulls it off again against Billowy and puts another one on the board here for Axiom. This time I actually pressed the right button. Ryung with some stellar TVP. I don't- I didn't think I'd ever see it. But hey, there you go. Someone managed to make Bioline with no Vikings work in a choke point against Colossus. Really awesome play there by Ryung. Absolutely phenomenal. There, there's my bias. Really well played. All right, well, we have a team fight on our hands, folks. The clan war will continue. And we will take it on to match number six. We're going to be seeing team captain Crank come out right here. He's going to be taking on Keen on New Polaris Rhapsody in a TVP. He needs to force it to the ace match to New Pompeii, which will... Almost, I mean, if we were to go by previous results, it would be Dongrei Gu versus Impact in a ZVZ. But I have to wonder if another player might come out and surprise us. Oh my. All right. Things are starting to get really interesting. We'll be right back after the break, folks. Don't go anywhere. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Shoutcraft Clan Wars. It is still all to play for, though Axiom remain one game behind in this Best of Seven Clan Wars series. It's going to be Captain Crank taking on Commander Keen here on New Polaris Rhapsody. We don't get to see TVP on this map too often, so that's going to be very exciting indeed. For those who don't know, this is their big red lava map, the one that can devour units every few minutes if you're not careful. So this is a nasty map to play on. Protoss do quite like it because, of course, the warp-in potential is there. There are many places to the side of the map that are safe from the lava that you can place your proxy pylons. So... Let's see what Crank has come up with here. Hopefully it's good, because Keen is no slouch. Ladies and gentlemen, to the northwest position here in the Red Trunks playing Protoss. For Team Axiom, it is Crank. Who is going really early with that probe. What on earth is... Is this an 11... This could be Proxy Gateway, ladies and gentlemen. To the southeast position in the Blue Trunks playing Terran, it's MVP Keen. This is a great map for Proxy Gateway, if you can get away with it. And this is why. This area right here, and this area right here. It's an absolutely huge main. Proxy play is very powerful. It looks like Crank, however, wants to try and set it up here. It's unlikely to be anything else. If the first thing you do is send your probe out, the chances are you are doing it because you want to build a gateway in the middle of the map and attack from there. Obviously, putting the gateway directly in the main is extremely risky, and it doesn't give you a huge amount of benefit. It saves you maybe about 10 seconds of running time. And Crank is going to place just going to be a single gateway here. So he's not going to overdo it. He's not going to go for a double proxy gateway, which is completely all in. A single proxy gateway actually isn't. You can macro behind that. If you do early damage, that puts you ahead. You can expand safely. So this is an interesting build here from Crank. 
It's pretty cool. We're seeing a gas first opening here from Keen. So it looks like what's most likely to be the case, although not exclusively the case, is that he wants to go Banshee. Great map for it. Obviously, any kind of airplay is good here. You have this area at the back here. You can very easily escape. But drop players also cool too. You can drop Widow Mines in here, for instance, and then run them into the mineral line. Heck, we've even seen some people try to do a proxy factory for that very reason. Keen Scouting, he is not going to see that proxy gate at all by the looks of it. So there will be a Zealot open here. The Zealot is going to be up and in the base before the Marine comes out. Will Keen actually scout it? No, he will not. And he, there's no reason why he'd ever be up there. So he's going to go across the map and he's going to see all too late. He will miss the Zealot coming in. It's becoming chrono boosted here immediately. And I expect some damage to be done here. It really depends on how good Crank's Zealot control is. He's going for a second Zealot. All right. Oh, man. This is actually really bad for Keen. Because he is going for that Banshee play here, this could do huge amounts of damage. Not only could this actually cancel the factory, but it slows down the ability for his opponent to actually defend. So, unless Keen walls off, which is difficult. You've got a wall off Ken with three buildings here. And Crank, I think, is going to go with two Zealots, surely. Yeah, he will. And the wall off is not done. This is going to suck. <laughs> this is really going to suck. He's going to see the Cybercore. He didn't see the Gateway. So now I think he knows. But the Zealots are on the way already. And there is no wall off available. So this is going to do damage. The question is just how much. It's up to Keen to minimize that damage as much as possible. And the factory finishes, unfortunately. So that's a pretty cool move here for Keen. That's actually really good for Keen. He's going to be able to build a Widow Mine. And a lot of SCVs have been pulled off the line here. Bear in mind, Crank's not all in with this. Looking for that surround. There's a Stalker coming in behind this as well. He can't really afford to lose that Zealot for free. And he's able to do a little bit of damage with it. Let's see just how good Crank's control really is. He's going to pick off a few SCVs here. He's going to be able to pick off the Marines as well. As we said, there is that Widow Mine coming out. So he does have to watch for that. But so far, seven workers have been killed from a proxy gate. Just one proxy gate. Maybe the most important thing to consider there. Widowmine's on the way out. He wants to try and... Oh, he's got to watch out for the positioning there. He does take the Marine out. He's out there quick enough. So he doesn't have to worry too much about that. And he wants to take the Supply Depot as well. Has Crank done enough damage? I think so. I really do. He's killed seven Zealots. He has also killed two Marines for the cost of... Somehow he lost a Stalker in all of that. I'm not... Did he? I don't remember him losing a Stalker. Maybe he just, yeah, he must have. I must have somehow just blanked on it. But yeah, you know, it says he lost a Stalker, so I guess he did. And he did lo lose enough resources for that. I think the trade's good. Yeah? And it's not crazy at all, you know. It's not like a single proxy gate is an insane build that will result in you just dying if it fails. And it did a decent enough damage, and I think it puts Crank in a good spot. He has his expansion going up, and he has a worker lead. But he is going to have to answer this starport now he knows the timing of the factory so he should be suspecting that something's going to come out here the question is what is king going to build he's going for a medevac he will be doing a drop probably with widow mines well a widow mine a hellion and four marines most likely this gateway is going to get shut down now so crank is going to have to build another pylon to compensate for that because otherwise he will end up being supply blocked he does know that so he's going to have to sort that out he is bring bringing an oracle out as well that won't help him too much against the drop plate so he's got to be thinking here, either Banshee or Drop, Banshee or Drop. And wow, that's a heavy supply block there for Crank. It's a little silly that he didn't build his pylon a little bit earlier than that. Doesn't matter a huge amount with, of course, Warp in Tech being on the way, but he doesn't actually have another gateway. So he has nothing to bring units in. And what is he going to defend with? He has a Mothership Core. So he has the photon overcharge, but he doesn't have enough energy yet. He's got a stalker, basically. But the Oracle is coming in, and there's no answer to that. And Keen is going to take a huge amount of damage in his back mineral line here. Not even a question about that. There's nothing to answer it. There is a Viking coming out, but it's coming out too late. There is pressure coming in here, but the photon overcharge is going to be done, I think, by the time this hits. So I'm not... I don't think that's going to do too much. The Oracle is destroying the mineral line of Keen. Keen barely has anything going for him economically here. And unless he's able to hit that with the Widow Mine, which would require a bit of a misplay, then we'll see. I don't know. Crank doesn't have a lot to defend it, but he's going to have that Photon Overcharge in a second. The Stalker does go down, though. And this, uh, this Nexus is still under pressure. Oracle still remains alive. It's in the corner here. There is a Viking out now, so this Oracle will die now. But it is still 26 workers towards 11. Keen is going to kill this base by looks of it, but no, the photon overcharge is triggered. Trank, Crank is going to be super careful with his control here, though. He can't lose units. He only has one gateway. And he's working with a mothership core, an almost energyless oracle, and one stalker to try and fight this off. And the widow mine is about to come back up as well. 
but he is using the detection to try and deal with this. How goes Crank Stalker Control? Evidently, it's not too shabby at all, and he is fighting this off. And Keen has got to do damage with this. He's taken far too many losses in his main to recover from this, especially with the Nexus being finished. And Crank is looking in a good spot. But he's still only on one gateway. So he's making all this happen with terribly, terribly small amounts of units. He has fought this attack off with a Mothership Core and, like, a Stalker for the last two minutes. And now he thinks he goes for it. He takes out the Medivac. So there is no going home now for these units, especially since the Terran player is about to have to deal with Lava Raising. So he's not going to be able to reinforce here either. Vikings come out to deal with the Oracle. So that's nice. But the Widow Mine gets killed before that matters. The Stim goes in, though. Actually, no. Never mind. Not the stim, but he does go in. He wants to do damage. He's bringing in reinforcements here. Crank doesn't have too many units left. Where's that mothership core? It doesn't have the energy as of yet. He needs to bring more units out. He's chrono boosting to try and get more units onto the field. Keen continues to fight here. There are probes. I mean, there's probably enough probes to fight this, but Crank needs to get good fights. He needs to get good engagements. Lava is rising up here. It's going to kill this reinforcing marine. And in fact, the reinforcements killed on the way out here. That's not good at all here for Keen. He is still fighting, though. He still has more units than Crank does. Crank is trying to get more gateways up and just survive and not take too much more economic damage. Wait for another photon overcharge. But the Mothership Core is taking damage. The Mothership Core is going to die. Another Stalker falls. Keen continues to try and make this happen. Keeping an eye on here. Another pylon goes down. But Crank is getting more gateways up. And once that happens, I have a feeling that Keen is going to lose. It's still... So close. Keen is fighting as much as he possibly can here. But two more gateways just came up. And I think that's it for Keen's aggression. There's nothing left here for that. And or Oracle came in in the back of all of that and did yet more damage. Keen actually evacuated here. But 30 workers killed by Crank. Keen getting absolutely devastated here and that's the army dead and Keen is now in a world of trouble he did manage to get his CC up behind this but the Oracle has done 10 more kills worth of damage Keen's on 12 workers versus 33 and Keen's aggression was so good like considering what he had that was amazing but I thought the defense was even better crank with basically no units at all was able to fight that back and now in comes the attack, and I don't think Keen will live through this by the looks of it. The Oracle will die, but there are Stalkers coming in. Crank finally has production. He's going to take this third base out, the second base out. It's going to lift. Maybe it lives. It might, especially with a Viking coming out to try and kill that Oracle, and we might see a good Widowmine hit. But let's be honest, Keen's in a world of trouble now, and Crank is doubling his supply. And at this point, it just seems to be a matter of time before Crank is able to go in and finish off Keen. Really cool early, but that gateway's still there. He might want to actually put a pile on there so he can actually get four gates on top of this. That would allow him to reinforce even more, but he's got a pile on in the natural now. There is going to be an attempted drop here, but Mothership calls up, and it's going to have energy for Photon Overcharge very shortly, so I don't see too much happening here. Another Supply Depot is down. Crank thinks he's got it, and I think he's right. He's going to go in. The bunker will never finish, and there's no units. GG. Keen knows it, and Crank brings it to the ace match. We do have a clan war on our hands now, don't we? <laughs> Axiom were down three games to one. They've now brought it to the ace match. They have five minutes to decide who their ace is going to be, and the map will be New Pompeii. We will find out after the break, folks. Who will be able to take it? Will Axiom be able to eke it out against MVP? Or will MVP close it out with a narrow 4-3 victory? We'll find out after the break. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Shoutcraft Clan Wars. We have reached the ace match between Axiom and MVP. And it will, of course, be a Zerg versus Zerg on New Pompeii. It's actually the reason we're retiring this map, because it is a very, very Zerg-favored map. So it's almost 95% of the time going to be a ZVZ here. And it will be again. We're going to have Dong Gu versus Impact in a Zerg versus Zerg. And I don't have any choice but to give the favor to Dong Rei Gu here. Impact has not been looking good today. As we mentioned, he does have a, a small injury to his wrist, but he has been picked as the ace nonetheless. One has to wonder if it's just because of this map and no other player really wanted to play on it. It may very well be. And this could be really bad for Impact, but his ZVZ has proven to be good in the past. We are talking about the guy that took out Jadong at DreamHack. Is he going to be good enough to deal with what is going to be a Ling Bane Ling War almost 100% of the time on this map? That's what ends up happening. So he's going to have to keep up with Dong Rei Gu. We're talking about the guy who has 500 APM. This is going to be difficult. Very difficult for Impact to pull off.
We'll see if he has the skills necessary. I think he, he really wants a win today. He's already lost two games. He lost his 1v1, and he lost the 2v2 as well. And he was looking pretty bad in the 1v1, honestly. He was looking very, very out of form. So the hope is that he is able to bring it back here, and he's going to need to because this is the decider. Can he handle the pressure? Well, I guess we're about to find out. I'm going to ask if our contestants are ready to begin. New Pompeii may be the very... What on earth? <laughs> Impact just randomly typing numbers in the chat. He will be the last man standing, as will Dong Wei Gu. Dong Wei Gu's been in this position thousands of times. Impact, not so much. And DRG ZVZ is a fearsome beast indeed. And this is a this map is a knife fight. There's no question about that. It is brutal. It is about bloodletting. Bleed your opponent out over a very short period of time before he bleeds you out. It's a double entrance map. It's a clock format, meaning that you go, you've got two ways you can go around in kind of a clockwise or anti-clockwise motion. And it is almost always decided by Ling Bane Ling Wars. It's just pure micro. It's very rare for any player to go to any other tech. It, we have seen, I think, you know, we have seen one ZVZ that went to muters. Everything else was decided with Ling Bane. So, taking on DRG in a Ling Bane War. I mean, it, it, this is his... This is just a stomping ground. He is absolutely comfortable in this kind of scenario. So, will Impact take a risk? Will he try to early pool Dong Rei Gu? Will it even work if he does? Let's find out. To the northeast position in the Red Trunks playing Zerg. The last man standing, the Ace 4 team MVP. It's Dong Rei Gu. Versus his opponent to the south position in the Blue Trunks playing Zerg. The Ace 4 Axiom. It's Impact. And it's going to be really hard for him. And that looks like... No, no. I almost thought I was going to be a nine pool there. Like, whoa, he's pulling a... Nope. But no. We're going to see overlords on nine for both. So we're not going to see ten pool. We're not going to see any action. Probably going to be a 14 pool. I cannot imagine either of these plays trying to hatch first on this map. But I don't know. You never know. It could happen. This is probably not a map that either of these players has really practiced. It's an ace match. You don't generally practice the ace. You know, you hope to kill them before the ace, so... But they should be at least relatively familiar with it. It is a map that has two entrances, which means that it is extremely susceptible to Ling Baneling attacks. DRG going gas first. Well, I guess we know who wants to be the aggressor here. Is Impact actually going to go... It's going to be a 15 pull, surely. Is he going to... He's going to hatch first, and he's going to hatch towards his opponent. Potentially a huge risk here. He does get, he will get the lava lead, of course, but this is going to be very quick speed out of Dong Rei Gu. It's not anything like 10 pull speed, but he's going to have the gas for speed about around when this finishes. And this is going to be a hatch first play out of impact. What does that mean for impact? It means if impact survives, he has the economic lead, he can afford to lose more drones, and more importantly, he has that ever precious lava. He will have more than his opponent. On one base, Dong Rei Gu will be producing seven lava at a time with a queen inject. Potentially, you could see 14 lava at a time out of impact. That's a massive difference in Ling Baneling. But the question is, can he keep it up? Especially considering he went... It doesn't actually make that much difference because the rush time with speedlings is not that much further apart, regardless of which direction you go in. But impact did expand towards his opponent. <clears throat> which is risky. And he's going to confirm that now. And we do have lings on the way already for Dong Regu. I think we're going to have to at least see a spine crawler here at a bare minimum out of impact if he wants to actually defend this. Dong Wei Gu will be the aggressor. He's going to have the speed lead, not by a huge amount. Baneling Nest coming down here for Dong Wei Gu as well. He wants to finish this quickly. Will impact be able to hold it? He's not going to have speed. Like, there's going to be like almost a full minute of Dong Wei Gu having speed where his opponent doesn't. That's the real problem there. Yes, there's going to be another hatchery. Yes, there's going to be an extra queen. Can he even defend that queen? Uh, that's that's a different matter entirely. Can Impact even get down a spine? He is going to... Uh, didn't lose it. Hasn't lost the drone yet. And there's a couple of Lings coming to meet up with this. So there's already Lings, of course, working on there because they want to be able to catch these Zerglings out as they spawn. No speed up as of yet. Impact starting to produce. And he will have that defender's advantage. He's going to have a lot of lava, but he's going to have to deal with Bane Lings quicker. A little bit of more damage done by Dong Rei Gu here. Dong Rei Gu getting the better end of these fights already. The Queen is up and an immediate inject comes in, however. A Spine Crawler comes down for impact. 
And now what we see is Dong Regu moving an Overlord here. I, I don't like this from Impact. He doesn't have an Overlord in the right position to keep an eye on this area. Because as we've seen many times before, a Baneling attack, a Baneling backstab can be very effective. Oh, how good are these Baneling hits going to be? One goes off, second one goes off. A Queen goes down already. But there should be enough reinforcements to hopefully save the Queen. It's not enough. And that means there's going to be a great deal of problems. One, defending against Banelings, and two, actually holding up and getting enough lava here. Dongregu is still the aggressor. Impact does have a little bit of a worker lead, but that hatchery is under pressure now. Can Dongregu kill it off before Impact is able to respond? One Baneling detonates pretty badly. Second Baneling is going right into the middle of those. The spine crawler blocks that off, and that is actually pretty bad for DRG to end up losing that. But the Lings come into the middle of the line. They're going to do damage. There's no queen there. They're fighting. The drones are fighting at this point. DRG continuing to flood in with yet more units. Another Baneling comes in, and there's not a huge amount of defense here for Impact. He's trying to hold on desperately, bring the spine up, gets another queen up here as well. But Impact is now behind in workers. He does, of course, have that lava lead, but he's down to eight workers versus 14. Not where you want to be at all. Another spine is up. Dongregu continues to pile on the pressure. He's morphing in Banelings to the side here. And Impact might even want to consider mining from his natural just because he's got a spine and queen there to help defend. But another Ling comes in and he's probably going to lose another drone. He is. No, he's not. Never mind. Almost did. The Banelings are actually, they've actually been caught out. So Impact is trying his best to defend here. But more drones are coming down. And look at this pressure that Dongregu has prepared here for Impact. And this is looking terrible for the Axiom player. He is way behind in almost all respects. Another drone goes down here. And I think that this is probably going to be it. I don't see, unless a genius Baneling hit comes off, which it doesn't. And there's the GG. A sad end for Axiom's run here, but kind of predictable, unfortunately. And Dong Rei Gu takes it. An MVP with a 4-3 victory in this series. Impact just looking completely off point today. As I said, he does have a small wrist injury, but well, there you go. Congratulations to MVP for their victory here, and commiserations to Axiom for narrowly losing out there with the ace match, but I don't, I don't really know, honestly, who else you could have sent out on that. New Pompeii is, is a ZBZ map. You've only got one Zerg player. If you happen to be Axiom, I suppose you don't really have much of a choice, but that's Axiom's third loss here in the Clan Wars. A really disappointing performance for them, who should be doing a hell of a lot better. Uh, they're a far more experienced team than most, and they lose a lot in this Clan War. It happens. That's unfortunate. So there you go. Congratulations to MVP, who continue to put on an absolutely stellar performance in the Climb War, however. Now, if we want to see the exact opposite, then we see MVP's performance that has just been phenomenal up to this point. Really, really good. MVP did lose to Mouse Sports. They actually got all killed by Mouse Sports, but they did beat Clan Who, and they did beat Startail, and they just beat Axiom as well. So they're looking at a 3-1 record here. Really strong. Just outside of that really weird loss to Mouse Sports, but outside of that, there you go. MVP is looking awesome in the Clan War and continues to do very well indeed. So congratulations to them for that. And that is going to be us about done. Thank you very much for watching the Shoutcraft Clan Wars. Hopefully you enjoyed that. And we will be back, as you can see on the schedule. Should be next week, but I'm going to have to reschedule a few of these things by the looks of it. As I mentioned earlier, I've got my surgery coming up. I'm going to have to move a couple of things around, but I will keep you posted. Keep an eye on the Team Liquid thread to find out exactly what's going on with the schedule for Clan Wars. My name has been Total Biscuit. Thank you very much for watching. A big thanks to MLG TV for sponsoring this Clan War. Remember, you can click follow on the channel to be alerted when Clan Wars go live, as well as grab the MLG TV app on the App Store and Google Play Store to be able to watch this on your mobile device. I'll see you next time.